duct tape version like I do, you want to be on page 741. 741. We'll be reading from Luke 17, verses 11 through 16. Luke 17, 11 through 16. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Some of the uh, brothers <coughs> were afraid that people wouldn't be able to see me standing down here, and I didn't know why anybody would want to. <laughs> I'd like to uh, invite you to go and visit the, the book table, uh, CD table back in the back, and even if you don't buy anything, you get a chance to meet my wife, Fran, and that'll make it worth the trip. All of the seven lessons I normally do in this series are on CD, and they're back there at the table, as well as the book called Catching Fire with the Holy Spirit. This guy's uh, wife had a cat that she absolutely adored. I mean, she talked to this cat, and she just loved this cat, and, and he absolutely hated this cat. <laughs> its hair was all over everywhere, got all over his clothes. It constantly rubbed its legs on his pants because he knew how much it aggravated him. If he was sitting reading, the cat would sneak up and jump into his lap, scare the life out of him. He clawed on the furniture. It was his job to empty the litter box, change it, and it smelled to high heaven. He despised this cat, and every time they put it outside, the cat would let loose this blood-curdling howl to get back in. So when his... Uh, his wife went to visit their daughter for a week. Uh, the guy did away with the cat. Uh, when his wife got home, she asked where the cat was. And he said he let it out and never came back. Well, she, uh, she was totally heartbroken. Depressed, she moped around the house every day. She wouldn't eat, couldn't sleep. She was just absolutely miserable. He thought she'd get over it, you know, in a week or so, but she didn't. It just got worse. And so yeah, she, she just lost all interest in life and she begged him every day to do whatever it took to get the cat back. So finally, in order to, to please his wife, he, uh, he ran an ad in the paper. And he posted signs all over the neighborhood with a description of the cat offering a $5,000 reward. His next door neighbor saw those signs around the neighborhood and came over and he said to this guy, you, you nuts? $5,000 for a cat that you hate? What are you going to do if somebody actually brings it back? <laughs> he said, if you knew what I know, you'd know I'm not risking anything. <laughs> James says in chapter 4, Do you not know 
Do you not understand that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is for nothing that the Scripture says, God yearns jealously for the Spirit that He has made to live in us. James says that if we're on friendly terms with the world, we are not on friendly terms with God. It's a pretty challenging thing. So, what about you? Would you say that you were on friendly terms with the world? What does that mean? What does that look like? Obviously, it's pretty serious because you can't be on friendly terms with the world and on friendly terms with God at the same time. He also says that there is a connection between being on friendly terms with God and the fact that God yearns, longs for the Spirit that He has made to dwell in us. That Spirit is the Spirit that was created in us by the Holy Spirit when we were born from above, when we were born of God. If you weren't here at the, the morning hour, why you missed that lesson. God, God caused that Spirit to dwell in us because He, just like us, wants to stay in contact with us. Now, I'm saying something important to you. You know how you feel about your kids. Mine are all grown, They've got kids of their own. They haven't produced any great grandchildren yet. <laughs> and I told them they better get started on it, because I don't know how much longer I'm going to be here, which I think they're quite willing to do. But anyway. God wants to communicate with His children. You know, I can say this now. I couldn't have years ago when I first started preaching. But if I give my son a cell phone so that he can call me and I can call him, I do that because I want him to stay in touch with me. That's how I feel. But if he never uses the cell phone, it doesn't serve its purpose, does it? Now, you can get this. And if we don't utilize the Spirit that God has given us so that we can communicate with Him and He can communicate with us, no communication takes place. You see, God is spirit, the Bible tells us. That's his nature. And it takes a spirit to communicate with a spirit. This isn't rocket science. And so the reason why God caused that spirit to live in you was so that he could communicate with you. And so that you could communicate with him. In John chapter 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6, Jesus says, It is the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, who gives life. Now stay with this. The words that I speak to you are Spirit. Okay? The words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. Being born of God and having that spirit 
that he has made to dwell in us is essential to understanding the spirit words that God speaks to us. Are you with me so far? Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are what? They're spirit. Those are spirit words. And only those who have that spirit that God has made to live in us can hear and understand the spirit words. The spirit words that Jesus spoke to the physical ears of those who heard him when he was here are being spoken today in the spiritual ears of his disciples. And they bring spiritual life to us. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, The Apostle Paul says, it is we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Now honestly, you don't have to speak, you don't have to raise your hand. Do you have any idea what it means to worship by the Spirit of God? You need to ask yourself that. It's an important question. Because the Bible says that's how we worship. The Bible says that's how we worship. I don't know how many times I can say that before we begin to understand how important this is. We worship by the Spirit of God. If we don't know what that means, how can we do it? I assume that you came here today to worship God. Paul says we do that by the Spirit of God. So if we aren't worshiping by the Spirit of God, is it a fair question to ask, are we worshiping at all? Because that's how we do it. So why is worshiping by the Spirit of God so important? Why is it that most of us have never heard a sermon on this? The John 4, 24 passage I referred to earlier says that God is Spirit. And those who worship God must worship in spirit, small s, and truth. Must means that worshiping in spirit is essential to worship. You can't worship any other way. It's essential. We must worship in spirit. We have talked a lot, and we should, about what it means to worship in truth. But we have been very strangely silent on what it means to worship in spirit. Why is that? It's essential, it's important. So what does that mean? What does it mean to worship in spirit? Well, it means this, among other things. It means that the external aspects of worship, what we call the acts or the forms, singing, praying, giving, communing, sharing in the word, it means that those things must be internally generated in order to be accepted by God as worship. It means you can do all of those things and not worship. That's what that means. 
You can sing, you can pray, you can give, you can eat the mat sauce and drink the grape juice and not worship. Unless there's something going on inside of you, just participating in those forms is not worship. But unfortunately, we place so much emphasis on the forms and not enough emphasis on what has to be going on inside of us in order for those forms to constitute worship of God. And the danger is, if you're like me and you know all the verses to a thousand hymns and you've been singing them all your life, I can sing those verses and sing the right part and not think anything about what I'm singing. I can do that. I mean, I can think about almost anything. When I do that, I'm not worshiping. I'm not worshiping. No, it's important. It's important that we stay focused internally on what's actually happening when we participate in one of these forms. The forms are not the worship. What's going on inside of us is the worship. Worship is, exter- is internal. It means that it is impossible to confine spiritual worship to buildings and to forms. Worship is your life. Worship is the way you conduct yourself every day. Worship is the way you treat your wife. Worship is the way you treat your husband. Worship is the way you treat your friends, your neighbors, the clerk at the grocery store. It's the way you treat other drivers when they don't act very nicely. You see, now we say, oh man, alive, now you're really, you're getting very close to my heart here. But it's true. We, we worship by who we are, not so much by what we do. And who we really are comes out when somebody cuts right in front of me, doesn't it? And that's not very comfortable for me or for anybody else. Worship is who we are. It's how we react when we don't have time to think about what would Jesus do. Okay? We don't have time to think about that. A daily awareness of our relationship with God must find an expression in everything we do. Whatever you do, whatever you do, the Bible says, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's tough, isn't it? Whatever you do, that covers everything. It's not whatever you do in the church building, but whatever you do. Worshiping by the Spirit of God does not require any act or form. It doesn't require that. It simply means that the Holy Spirit has prompted an internal spiritual desire to express my love and gratitude to God. And so, I'm sitting out on the deck at my house, And I look over, and I see the sunset, and I say, thank you, Lord God, for that sunset. That is worship. Thank you for that sunset. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the majesty of the mountains. Thank you for coming to the earth. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me my children. Sometimes. (laughs) 
sometimes I say, I wonder if you'd be willing to take them back. <laughs> no form is necessary for that kind of worship, for that kind of worship, but it's still worship. But forms are important because they serve us as a means of expressing what's in our heart. See, the forms are not unimportant. They're the vehicle I use to express what's in my heart. And so on Valentine's Day, if I remember, I do something for my wife. I bring her some flowers, or I buy her something, or I, I write a card, and I, I hand it to her. Well, that the card is not my love. The card expresses my love. You, you, you got this, okay? It, it's an expression. That's all that it is. It, it isn't the thing that's important. It's what the thing represents that's important. One night, many, 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 many years ago, it's really interesting to me, I had a dream. I mean, like 30 years ago, I had a dream. I still remember it vividly. Do you ever had one like that? You know, most of the time I wake up in the morning and I think, I want to tell Fran what I dreamed, but by the time I get downstairs, I can't remember it. It's gone. And she says, what were you going to tell me? I said, well, I was going to tell you what I dreamed last night. Well, what was it? I don't know. She said, I think you're losing it. Which is probably true. There's nothing really noteworthy about dreaming, except I don't dream much anymore, at least not like that. If I do, I don't remember them. I was impressed, terribly impressed, by how real this dream was. In my dream, I was visiting a prison. It was a women's prison. At least all the people in my dream were women. I don't know if there's anything Freudian about that or not. <laughs> I just record it as a fact. So in my dream, I was going from one cell to another, and I was counseling and praying with the, these women who were in prison. At one point, I stood in front of several cells. They were arranged in like a half-moon circle, like that, all around me. And I preached um, a brief but inspired message on salvation by grace. I wish I could remember the sermon. <laughs> I've never preached one that good or that brief in real life. <laughs> no, no. I, this is so, I don't know. While I was preaching, these, here they go. I noticed off to my right, over here, in an isolated cell, a little dark, dingy cell, there was an old lady sitting on a stool in that cell over there. She was really old. Her hair was long, gray, and stringy. Her face was so deeply lined with wrinkles that it distorted her features. Well, a few minutes later, I glanced back, and she was standing up. And she was gripping the bars over the, overhead like that. And she had her face wedged between the bars so tightly, her eyes were just slits, which heightened her grotesque appearance. She was looking at me, and she was hanging on every word I said. Well, when I finished my lesson on grace, I guess my Church of Christ background influenced my dream because I started to sing, Oh, Why Not Tonight, as an invitation song, which was really stupid. I mean, they couldn't come forward if they wanted to. <laughs> No, I'm not making this up. I, I was just about to start the second verse. 
and she spoke. And what was so startling was her voice was not like her appearance at all. Her voice was like the voice of a much younger woman, low, melodic, vibrant voice. And she said, sing Home on the Range. <laughs> no, she did. That's my dream. I'm telling you what happened. I said, uh, I said, I don't think that would be appropriate in a worship service. She said, oh, why not tonight isn't very appropriate either. <laughs> she said, I know it's not exactly a church song, but it would mean so much to me to hear it again. And I don't think that God would grudge it to me. Now, what do you think about that? Do you think God would grudge it to her if we sang Home on the Range? Depends on how much you think about God, what kind of a God he is. Well, I was ashamed for having refused her and of talking to her about propriety in worship. When she was so obviously moved by my speaking about the grace of God, so I said I would. And I began to sing. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. Where seldom is heard a discouraging word And the skies are not cloudy all day Home, home on the range Where the deer and the antelope play where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. As I sang, I watched her mouth the words like she was praying and then she began to cry. And she cried all the way through. And I was so moved, I sang it again. And I walked over to her cell, and through the bars, I hugged her. And I cried because I, I understood how a heart sick with sin, a heart that was reaching for God, a heart that was yearning to find a spiritual expression, might find it in that song. There are many ways of expressing our desire, our love for God, more than most of us have ever suspected. That was the end of the dream. I woke up with a little different view on what is appropriate in worship and what home means. I also woke up wondering if God still speaks to us in dreams. I hummed home on the range every day for three months. I even thought about suggesting it as an invitation song one Sunday. But it would only be appropriate to those who understand what the heart of worship is and what it means to be homesick. And that's the preacher's job, you know. Yeah, it's my job to make you homesick. To make you want to go to heaven so badly 
that you will pay any price, even everything you have, to get there. And of course, that's what it takes, you know. Everything you have. I am not unaware of the excesses and distortions of Scripture there have been in reference to the work of the Holy Spirit. It alarms me a little to hear people say, God told me to, or the Spirit is leading me to, simply because they want divine approval for justifying doing some off-the-will thing that has come out of their own imagination. Those kinds of experiences have caused many of us, myself included, to look with suspicion on this entire area of biblical teaching. Brothers and sisters, we cannot afford to disregard clear, consistent Bible teachings because others have manipulated and distorted them. We cannot afford to disregard anything God has said to us because somebody else has misused it. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says that the presentation of our bodies as a living sacrifice constitutes spiritual worship. You're familiar with that passage, I'm assuming. Does it ever strike you as odd that that form, the presentation of your body, never made the list of acts of worship? Isn't that interesting? It's right here in the Bible. No, look at me that way. That presentation is not simply the presence of our physical body at the assembly. It is the way we approach every facet of our daily lives. It is how we do our jobs. It's how we work in our marriages, our recreation. It's what determines what we watch, what we read, and what we listen to. The presentation of our bodies as living sacrifice constitutes spiritual worship. But in the Philippians passage I read at the outset of the lesson, we learned that our worship is by the Spirit of God. So what role does the Holy Spirit play in worship? Since the spirit of worship, the internal aspect of worship is generated internally, the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, provides the spiritual stimulus that creates the internal spiritual atmosphere for spirit and truth worship. I'll say that to you again. Since the spirit of worship is generated internally. The Holy Spirit, who indwells us, provides the stimulus that creates the internal spiritual atmosphere for spirit and truth worship. And that is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I will sing with my spirit and I will sing with my mind also. It is that God created spirit that allows us to sing with that spirit. I appreciate how patiently you've listened. I, I'm almost finished. I, I just want so badly 
for us to understand this because it will tremendously improve the atmosphere of your assembly. It will, it will change the atmosphere in this room tremendously. And, and that, that atmosphere is not just important for you. It is equally important for people who visit here. Have you ever just gone to a place, a place of worship, and you came away saying, wow, have you ever had that experience? Wow, that, that was really something. That's the kind of atmosphere that you want to generate here. So that people who leave here will say, boy, the Spirit of God is sure with those people. Isn't that what you want? You nod your head, yes. Yes, that's what you want. You want people to leave here saying, I can't wait to go back. That was really something. It is that indwelling spirit that allows us to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we do in the communion, isn't it? We're actually proclaiming the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord until he comes back. It is that spirit that God has made to dwell in us that enables us to spiritually examine ourselves before we participate in the sacrament. That, that examining that is supposed to take place every time. And I don't think we take it seriously enough. We're supposed to be examining ourselves every time, spiritually, before we participate in the sacrament. Did you know that there's nothing wrong with not participating? Did you know that's not a sin? What is a sin is to participate in it in the wrong spirit. No, you're better off not to than to do it in a way that doesn't honor what Jesus did for us. It's not a sin to do that. It may be the most spiritual thing you do since you got here. It is that indwelling spirit that allows us to judge the body rightly. Worshiping by the Spirit of God means that our participation in the sacrament is a spiritually driven experience that actually allows us to participate in the death of Jesus on the cross. We actually participate in it. That's what the Bible says. That's the word it uses. It is a participation in. And every time we discern the body and the blood, we die once again to ourselves. Every time we participate in the sacrament, discerning what Jesus did for us, we die again every time to ourselves so that we can also experience the transforming power of our resurrection to abundant and everlasting life. To those who have the Spirit from God, the sacrament is not just a symbol. It's not just a representation. It's not just a form. It is a literal participation in the reality of the cross. This assembly is not just a group of people who by their choice 
have banded together in a common goodwill cause. We do not come here by habit. We do not come here by our decision. We come here because we have been called here. We come here because we have been called here. We have been led here by a common spiritual summons from the Holy Spirit to satisfy an insatiable yearning to find expression for those deep-seated, spirit-driven longings to experience once again our sinfulness, our unworthiness, and to express our love and gratitude to offer our praise and exaltation to confess our sins, to receive forgiveness, and to see God. We come here to see God. And it is the responsibility of those who lead this assembly to try to make sure that that happens. You came here to see God. Not me. You came to see God. And if you haven't done that today, then I failed you. Well, that's the lesson for this hour. Thank you. Thank you for honoring me by asking me to come. I thank Terry so much for the invitation and for the elders who have allowed me to come. It's been an honor to be here. It has been. And I pray that we have worshiped today by the Spirit of God. If you have any needs to bring before the congregation, you may do that as we stand together and as we sing.